Hello everyone, it's Thursday and you're watching Within the Frame. I'm Kim bo -kyung. South Korea is aiming to reach the 40,000 U.S. dollar mark for per capita gross national income by the end of 2027. Yet with the depreciation of the Korean won brought about by the Fed's monetary tightening policy, South Korea's GNI per capita fell below Taiwan's for the first time since 2002. Meanwhile, the Federal Reserve has decided to take a baby step raising interest by one quarter of a percentage point. What are the reasons behind the Fed's move and how will this affect South Korea's economy? For an in-depth analysis, we welcome Eric Song Soo Kim, adjunct professor at Hanyang University and UNIST, founder and CEO of Data Crunch Global, into the studio. Professor Kim, welcome into nice the show. Nice to have you again. <laughs> And we also have Lee Moon Sub, assistant professor at UC San Diego School of Global Policy and Strategy on the line. Professor Lee, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. All right, first question to you, Professor Kim. Uh, the UN administration announced last year that it would aim to raise per capita gross national income to 40,000 US dollars by the end of 2027. And before we get into the details, uh, how is GNI different from the uh, GDP and what significance does this 40,000 US dollar target have? So GDP measures the total size of the economy, um, which composed of our um, Korean national companies and um, consumers and investment, export, um, savings, etc., plus the uh, foreign um, you know, activities within our territory and economy. GNI is um, measuring our income levels. So how much salary do we receive in Korea mm -hmm. and overseas for Korean nationalities? So it is a measure to um, understand how wealthy we are mm. as a country. So 40,000 US dollar is symbolic because it will um, be a symbolic measure to define whether we are a advanced economy mm -hmm. or not. So in that domain, um, it is a meaningful uh, measure. Right, so GNI is an indicator of how wealthy uh, Koreans are. Yes, as an individual. Right, yes. um, Professor Lee, uh, gross national income per capita fell almost 8% to 32,661 US dollars last year, according to the Bank of Korea earlier in March. And surprisingly, last year's decline has reportedly put Korea's GNI per capita below that of Taiwan for the first time since 2002. Why such a dramatic fall in GNI? Sure. So 8% decline in GNI per capita last year was mostly driven by 12% increase in one to dollar exchange rate. On a one basis, the Korea's GNI per capita actually has increased by 4%, which is the difference between the 12% and 8%. But many other Asian countries also experienced the increase in exchange rate the because of the rapid uh, tightening monetary policy in the U.S. However, in Taiwan, the Taiwan's the exchange rate increased only by 6%, which is a half of the 12% increase in Korea's exchange rate. So that basically flipped the ranking between Korea and Taiwan in GNI per capita. So the decline in GNI per capita last year the reflects the mostly the change in the value of domestic currency rather than the change in income evaluated at domestic currency. Right, so it was mainly because of the weak Korean won against the dollar. Now, Professor Kim, when asked whether South Korea's GNI per capita can reach the level President Yoon suk uh, promised, the Bank of Korea said it is possible, but with certain preconditions met. So what are they and what is your takeaway from this? So if we um, look at the average GNI growth over the recent years, it's about 2.5% um, annually. So if we maintain that target, um, it, is, it seems like we can meet the 40,000 uh, US dollar GNI target mm -hmm. by 2027. Mm -hmm. But there are certain conditions that we also have to um, think into account. As Professor Lee said, the current um, the exchange rate mm -hmm. will determine the level of GNI. So we will have to um, assume that our economy goes back to around a 1,150 um, Korean one to US dollar target to maintain and achieve the 40,000 um, US dollar GNI target. Right, I see. Now, uh, Professor Lee, 
Even if the goal is achieved, however, experts say the target is not exactly a good barometer for life satisfaction, and thus they argue that government would have to make efforts so that people can actually feel the difference. What should be done? Well, as Professor Kim said, the GNI measures the average income, but that's the only one aspect of the well-being of people in the country. So there are three other major the components of the well-being, the aspect of the well-being, the first has the second leisure and third equality. So Korea is in general doing well in health, but not so well in leisure and equality. For example, compared to OECD average, the life expectancy is higher, but Koreans are working for a longer hours and the inequalities across the gender and age groups are higher. So then what should be done? So whenever the government face the trade-off between income and leisure or income and equality, so the government should conduct a careful the cost-benefit analysis, the taking into account other aspects of the well-being just beyond the income measured by GNI. Right, I see. So the government would have to focus on improving uh, leisure and equality sector. Right. Now, uh, Professor Kim, since Fed's aggressive monetary policy is related to the depreciation of Korean won, and that is what caused the fall in GNI, I'd like to also tap on uh, the Fed's recent decision. The U.S. Central Bank has announced a 0 uh, 0.25 percentage point interest uh, rate increase. What do you believe were the re main reason behind Fed's taking baby step instead of a big one? So Fed's monetary policy um, tightly is um, determined on the market situation. Mm -hmm. So currently, um, Fed is um, looking at a couple of indicators, and one of the um, determinants are inflation rates and also the um, employment index. So because the U.S. economy is showing a very, very strong um, index in terms of employment, mm -hmm. Fed is considering that okay, we can still we still have room to increase mm. um, interest rate to control mm. the inflation situation. However, the recent failure um, for uh, some banks called uh, so-called by um, SVB mm -hmm. or um, Credit Suisse and um, you know the risk of small banks yes. have put um, tr pressure on Fed's decision right. to go for a big step. Mm. But however, the market was expecting mm. that um, the Fed would not raise interest rates mm. um, this time or even get into a decision of decreasing interest yes. rates um, mm -hmm. this year. Mm -hmm. But Fed made it really, really clear mm -hmm. that Fed will continue to increase the interest rate. So the baby step um, of a quarter of a 1% is probably a psychological big step in the market. Psychological big step. Right. Right, interesting. Uh, Professor Lee, originally there was a possibility of Federal Reserve to hike rates by half a percentage point, but ultimately took a milder tone due to, like our Professor Kim said, a global banking turmoil. And could you briefly tell us what led the failure of Silicon Valley Bank and the crisis at Credit Suisse to happen and how they were managed? Sure. Both Silicon Valley Bank and Credit Suisse the, took substantial risk during the pandemic. So let me take the Silicon Valley Bank as an example. So the Silicon Valley Bank the, invested heavily in U.S. The government bond. The bond price, which is negatively related to interest rate, the, decreased a lot last year I mean, during the rapid the, tightening monetary policy in the U.S., but the bank didn't hedge their massive interest rate risk. So when the bank collapsed, the government intervened quickly and decided to the bail out its depositors. So it was costly, but at the same time, necessary action to take to mitigate the cost and to prevent the contagion to other sectors. And also, the, it was also the, the failure of the financial the regulation. The, the government needed to take some responsibilities the, when the crisis happened. Right, I see. Now, Professor Kim, though managed uh, 
The bank collapses cause panic around the world, of course, and some even fear a repeat of the catastrophe that followed the Lehman Brothers bankruptcy in 2008. Should South Korea be worried as well? Um, the South Korean banking system, a U.S. banking system, is um, somehow very different mm -hmm. because we have a different regulatory requirements and we are a separate market. Of course, our economy um, gets greatly influenced by the U.S. economy. But at least for the um, first um, banking sectors, mm -hmm. we have a very strong measure to control the um, bank stability and soundness. However, um, the secondary banking sector have issued too much of a um, you know, project financing for real estate projects. Mm. And that might um, you know, eventually get, to, get into a risk. Mm -hmm. But I believe that the government will have strong controls on the um, bank you know, regulations mm. to um, deal with that in advance. And that's what um, the government is right, currently doing. Right, so it's good to hear we have capability to deal with this kind of uh, crisis if it comes. Mm -hmm. um, but after witnessing global banking turmoil, uh, South Korea's lawmakers have proposed a bill to raise the limit on individual deposit insurance for the first time in 22 years to move uh, more than 100 million Korean won from current 50 million. Mm -hmm. And even apart from the banking turmoil, uh, many agree with introducing this measure because uh, the South Korean economy has grown uh, very much in size since two, uh, 2001. And what, what are your thoughts on this? So in 2001, our GNI was about 10,000 US dollars compared 10, to um, more than 30,000 mm -hmm. US dollars currently. So. It was only uh, one, uh, less than one third of our current income levels. Mm -hmm. So um, given that, I think it's reasonable to increase um, the minimum mm -hmm. uh, allowance for deposit insurance. However, our most of our accounts, so about 98% of our bank accounts, are has um, lower than the insurance limit of 50, um, five, 50 million um, Korean won, but that might be a statistical bias. Mm -hmm. People are depositing under the insurance coverage level. So yes. I mm -hmm. think that increasing the insurance deposit level to 100 million standards will give the psychological safety that our banking sectors will be safe, even if, that's, if, even if there is a crisis. Mm -hmm. So that will pretty much um, help our government and the economy to prevent a bank run situation mm -hmm. like US. Right. So increasing the limit could have a lot of benefits. It will provide a psychological safety, I would right. say. Right, <laughs> psychological safety. <laughs> right, uh, Professor Lee, uh, going back to Fed's decision this time, though the Fed took a more gentle approach, will the uh, FOMC back up its aggressive inflation fighting rhetoric and raise interest rates again in the next rate setting meeting? What are your thoughts about this? Wow, that's a big question. So the Fed is the facing the challenging job, the, the balancing the price stability and financial market stability. For now, the market expectation is more or less equally divided. A hub is expecting a 25 basis point increase in the next FOMC meeting to the team down inflation. And another half is expecting the no change in the rate to the ensure the financial market stability. So if I see the similar degree of the financial market stability as of today, I would expect the, the 25 basis point increase because the current inflation is three times higher than the Fed's target, but that's the big assumption. So we will see the many new information from now on until March 2nd and 3rd, the next FOMC meeting. So it depends on whether we see the further signals of the financial potential financial crisis from now on until the next meeting. Right. We will have to wait and see. Uh, Professor Kim, we cannot leave out what impact Fed's uh, latest decision could have in, uh, on South Korea. Uh, Bank of Korea's rate-setting meeting is scheduled uh, to take place in mid-April, this uh, just three weeks from now. Uh, how will the Fed's latest decision going to affect the Bank of Korea's monetary policy? Any projections? Okay, so because Fed raised a quarter point um, 
interest rate, um, the current Fed's interest rate is about 5%, mm -hmm. while our interest rate is 3.5%. Right. So there's a 1.5% spread, which is historical. Mm -hmm. um, the problem is we cannot keep up with the Fed's um, speed of increasing interest rates mm -hmm. as an economy. It will impact our economy so greatly. Mm -hmm. So we will have to get into a decision of how much spread we should allow for our economy. But the good thing is that Fed only increased quarter points this time, mm -hmm. quarter percent this time. So we have an option to either freeze the interest rate or raise a baby step. So that will be um, dependent on the current um, situation, how it evolves in the global economy, mm -hmm. um, and assessing the, assessing the aftermath of the Fed's quarter percent um, interest rate increase. Hmm. Right, I see. Now, uh, Professor Lee, this could be another big question, but uh, the OECD on Friday revised down South Korea's growth outlook for 2023 to 1.6% while estimating 3.6% inflation, which is down 0.3 percentage points from its previous forecast. Given the data, when should we expect a pivot to take place? Sure. So zero, I mean, 0 0.2 or 3 percentage point, the change in the revision is definitely within the forecast error bound. So we shouldn't pay too much attention on the direction of the revision when the revision is this, the small amount. And the current expectation is consistent to the what Bank of Korea forecasted the last month. Forgetting about the exact numbers, so we are expecting the slow economic growth and moderate level of inflation. So that is again the representing the challenging task the Bank of Korea is facing the balancing between the economic growth and the taming down inflation as so far as, as we discussed in today's interview. Right, I see. I'd like to ask more questions to our experts, but unfortunately, this is all the time we have for today's edition. Thank you, Professor Kim and Professor Lee, for your insights. We really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, this is all for Within the Frame tonight. We will be back tomorrow with more in-depth stories. Thank you for watching and goodbye.